and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Our summer heat has finally arrived in Oklahoma and with it, some concerns about cattle. For perspective, SUNUP's Dave Deacon talked with our livestock behavior specialist, Michelle Calvo Lorenzo. Michelle, what are some of the signs producers should be looking for with heat stress in cattle? Yeah, so with heat stress in cattle, you'll typically see animals uh, increase their respiration rates. They'll start breathing much faster. You'll also see in severe cases, they'll do what we call panting, um, where that, that can increase in severity. So animals will actually be uh, breathing in a labored fashion with open mouths, a lot of drooling. Sometimes their necks are extended erectly. And so uh, th those are clear signs that animals are, are really starting to have to cool themselves off uh, physiologically and are trying to regulate their body temperature and, and adapt to the environment, um, especially in situations where they can't cool themselves off with shade or water. You can also look and see if animals are eating because if they are really heat stressed, um, eating produces heat within the animal. So you'll tend to see that they back off and actually may not be consuming their feed. Is there anything that, 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 that cattle producers can do to help the, the, the cattle in the fields? Absolutely, there's lots of things cattle producers can do. Um, and what we see here behind us is a great indicator of one of these strategies is providing animal shade. Mm -hmm. um, by providing them shade, you're taking them away from the, uh, from the solar rays, which uh, put heat onto the animal and which they have to cope with. So giving them shade is important and it's got a lot of benefits. You just have to make sure that the structure itself is big enough to provide all the animals enough, uh, enough square footage. They recommend 20 to 40 square feet per animal of shade. And you also want to make these structures tall enough, somewhere uh, taller than eight feet in general, uh, so that you don't impede airflow because airflow is another important component to helping animals cope with heat stress. Uh, and allowing for them to have air pass over their bodies helps, helps with the cooling mechanism and how they release heat. So giving them shade and not, not impeding on the airflow or ventilation of their environment is important. Another major and important strategy is providing them adequate clean water. And so during hot summer days, that, that water requirement is going to be elevated, so they're going to want to drink more. You got to make sure that you provide them that extra amount of, of water that's needed. And by cleaning it on a weekly basis, you'll continue to encourage them to drink more water because just like us, they like clean water too. Okay. It, it, does the hide color play any role into temperature sure. retention? Sure, sure. When we talk about different uh, factors that can uh, put an animals at more risk mm -hmm. with heat stress, color is definitely um, uh, one of those factors. Uh, black hided animals just have to deal with more, it, they absorb more of that solar radiation. Um, animals that are sick and have chronic respiratory issues are also going to be at higher risk because just like we talked about before, uh, respiration is one of the primary mechanisms that these animals use to cool themselves off. So if they're sick and they've got uh, complications with their respiratory system, then they're not going to be able to, to exhale a lot of that heat as effectively as normal healthy animals would. And also animals that are uh, have more fat on them, mm -hmm. they also have a, a much more difficult time releasing that heat through their skin. So lots of different factors play a role and like you said, black hides is definitely um, is one of those factors that can make it more difficult for an animal to cope with the heat. Okay, and, and then we got to get out there and we got to work with them. We got to feed them and all that. Is there a better time to work with them? Absolutely. Working animals and getting them out of their home pens or home pastures and, pu and putting them through um, through a walk or through a distance or a hike, you know, to a working facility, it stresses them out. And, and just that alone can elevate their temperatures one to three degrees, which is a lot. Um, and so if you absolutely have to work the animals, it's recommended that they get worked as early in the day as possible. And that if you do have to put them into working facilities or holding facilities that you keep that time that they're in there to a maximum of about 30 minutes and just really minimize the stress that those animals have to endure because they're already stressed from the heat they're going to have to deal with later on in the day. Are, are, are there tools out there to help cattle producers manage this? Yes, there's actually lots of wonderful tools today. Mm -hmm. um, in just the past three or four years, there's been lots of neat things that are out there for producers to find, um, especially pertaining to heat stress. And so um, you can, uh, producers can easily find uh, local weather forecasts on the radio, the television, on the internet um, to their particular location. So they can find uh, forecasts as to what the week's weather is like, what the day's weather is going to be. So they can go ahead and start thinking ahead and setting up shade structures or, or bringing in extra water if needed. Um, and a lot of these sites also are now uh, providing uh, heat stress indexes or cattle comfort advisors, which is really neat because these measures and these models take in all of these different weather information that is out there for producers uh, to, to receive and they 
kind of plug it all into a model and they, they essentially give you a number, you the producer a number, and that number essentially estimates what the comfort level of that animal is given all these different complex things like wind speed and temperature and humidity and even the solar radiation. Um, so these models are becoming much more complex in understanding that weather and the environment is very different from one location to the next and they're trying to give us more accurate understanding of what the animal's feeling like. That way producers can instantly and quickly uh, start taking the appropriate steps to making sure their animals have all the tools they need to overcome those really hot temperatures. And you can even find really neat apps that help uh, producers um, uh, figure out some strategies on, on preventing heat stress. So there's an app for everything. And now we've got apps for heat stress. Mm -hmm. And it's wonderful. There's a, a, an app called Thermal Aid that was produced uh, and generated by researchers at University of Missouri. And this app actually helps producers measure respiration rates. And it also helps the producers to plug in their local temperature and humidity information so that they can collectively look at what the estimate of the cattle comfort is um, and they can and they can use that uh, to, to start taking the proper uh, strategies and steps to helping their animals. And here in the state of Oklahoma, we've got the wonderful Mesonet um, that now provides a cattle comfort advisor. And so these are numbers that producers can instantly get on the internet and they can look in their particular uh, region and their counties and see what the numbers look like for their particular animals. And again, take the appropriate steps to stay in the comfortable range right. um, for, for heat stress. Okay, thank you much, Michelle you. Calvo Lorenzo. And we'll put a link to that on our website, sunup.okstate.edu. In the past two weeks, wheat's down 70 cents, corn 50, and soybeans $1.25. Here to help us understand what's going on, Kim Anderson, our grain marketing specialist. Kim, let's start with wheat. Well, you can look at uh, wheat, uh, the, the production of uh, wheat and the ex expectations on ending stocks for the 14-15 marking year. Those ending stocks just keep going up as world production looks good. Of course, in the hard red winter wheat area, our, our harvest probably came in as we expected, uh, soft red, uh, maybe a little less. Spring wheat looks good. And the, the deal is, is we've just got more than adequate wheat around the world. Now, is that the same situation we're seeing with corn? If you look at corn, uh, the U.S. production, uh, probably around 14 billion bushels uh, this year. That's going to be a record or near record production. Ending stocks for corn, remember two years ago, they were around 800 million bushels, probably oh, 1.2, 1.3 billion uh, for this year. Next year, they're looking at almost 1.8 billion bushels of corn on any stocks. So what we got is production higher, and we've got more, uh, it, both in the U.S. and world, more corn in the bin. And of course, higher, higher supply, lower demand. All right, now both of those have some pretty big drops, but soybeans is the biggest of all. What's happening with that commodity? Well, we're looking at core, uh, soybean ending stocks for this uh, next marketing year to probably either go up to two and a half times. Uh, you know, they've been tight for the last few years uh, with record soybean production. I think that's a given, maybe even 3.7 billion bushels of soybean production. We're gonna have our ending stocks go up by two and a half, uh, a 250 percent that's going to lower price all right kim anderson grain marketing specialist here at oklahoma state university hi i'm al sutherland with your mesonet weather report many oklahomans started off their wednesday morning with rain a radar map from 8 a.m. Wednesday showed a wide band of rain from Woodward to Oklahoma City to Broken Bow. When we think rain, we think water. There is another side to rain, and it really showed up on Wednesday. Rain brings cooler temperatures. On an air temperature map from noon Wednesday, the rain was falling in and around the green-colored areas. Temperatures in those areas were 20 degrees cooler than in areas to the southwest and northeast. It was 68 degrees at Washington and Byers. Yes, the cloud cover is shading these cooler map areas, but there is also cooling from evaporative cooling. It's just like the cooling from a swamp cooler running on a hot day and blowing out cool, moist air. 
Dew point temperature is an index of the moisture in the air. A map at noon on Wednesday shows significantly higher dew point temperatures in the green map areas in a band across the center of the state. In the dark green areas over in the southeast, dew points were at or above 70 degrees. The slightly drier tan and brown areas to the northeast and southwest had dew points 5 to 10 degrees lower and way out in the panhandle, Kenton had a dew point of 56, 16 degrees lower than McAllister at 72. In the wide band of cooler, wetter air across the center of the state, relative humidity percentages were in the upper 80s and low 90s. To the southwest and northeast, relative humidity values were much lower in the 40s. By 5.30 Wednesday, the Mesonet rainfall map had some high rainfall numbers for Mesonet towers in Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City West had two and 53 hundredths, the North Mesonet Tower three and eight hundredths. Oklahoma City East just under four inches at three and 91 hundredths. The small yellow areas in McCurtain and LaFleur counties to the southeast had over four inches. The green colored areas in the bands across the state received an inch or more of rain. Our train of rains from late May through June and now into July has pushed up the risk of foliar plant diseases. Our peanut leaf spot map for the 14 days from June 26 through July 9th has many areas colored dark green, yellow, or red with leaf spot infection hours above the 36 hour treatment threshold. The pecan scab hours over the same 14 days also shows areas above treatment thresholds. These range from 10 to 30 scab hours depending on the susceptibility of the tree variety being grown. Highly susceptible varieties need protection at 10 hours, while native pecans or improved varieties with low susceptibility need protection at 30 scab hours. Pressing on to grapes, the number of grape black rot risk days since March 15th ranges from a high of 77 in the southeast to a low of 9 at Kenton in the Panhandle. Thanks for joining us for this edition of the Mesonet Weather Report. Joining us now is Jody Campici, our Ag Policy Specialist, to give us a little update on the Farm Bill. And Jody, I guess it's safe to say it's really been a waiting game and a test of everyone's patience. Yes, yes it is. Uh, we've still been waiting on some rules and guidelines from both the Risk Management Agency for new crop insurance programs and the Farm Service Agency for new commodity programs. So in terms of implementation, what are you telling producers who are having questions about when can I expect to see something? Well, the rules and guidelines should be out later this summer. The first thing producers will likely receive is a letter from the Farm Service Agency probably early this fall detailing what their base acres are and their payment yields and they can kind of start thinking about whether they want to update their base or their payment yields from that information. And then when do you think that sign up will actually occur for those commodity programs? That is likely to be much later this year. Uh, FSA has published a, a kind of a timeline and it looks like it's going to be later this winter. There's a possibility it might even be early next year, but I'm kind of anticipating maybe late, late this year. But for you and the team with the OSU extension and the, and the policy group, you're already working on some tools that you'll roll out to producers later on this summer, early this fall? Yeah, we have some Excel-based tools to help producers decide about the payment yield update, the base update, deciding between the new commodity programs, the Agris coverage ARC or price loss coverage, a PLC program and also some of the new crop insurance programs. That will be done in the next probably month or two and we'll provide some more information about how to get to those decision tools. Okay, so we'll have you back on to talk more about that when you're ready. Now in terms of livestock and that disaster program, give us an update on that and where Oklahoma fits in that picture. Okay. The first program that's been implemented within the 2014 Farm Bill is the Livestock Disaster Assistance Programs. And specifically, the Livestock Forage Program has been very important for Oklahoma producers. Sign up began in uh, April and it's still continuing. We still have quite a few producers who actually haven't signed up yet because they're on a waiting list with the Farm Service Agency to get in to do that. But right now, uh, as of I think June 1st, maybe June 1st, June 15th, 
total dollars that have gone to Oklahoma producers is about $52 million. And we are at the top of the list, uh, receiving the most funding so far from the Livestock Forage Program. And we know how tough it's been for Oklahoma cattle producers. Uh, it, it's, been a, it's been a rough few years, to say the least. Sign up can continue, and, and producers can still get enrolled in that. Just keep trying. Yes, they definitely just need to call their local Farm Service Agency office. The way the Farm Bill handled this program is it went back and covered losses for 2012, 2013, and 2014. So right now, producers are receiving funds for losses that occurred due to droughts you know, over the last three years. Okay. Great update. Jody, we'll see you again soon when you have some tools to roll out and we'll help everybody through this farm bill process. Thanks a lot. Jody Campici, our Ag Policy Specialist. Temperatures have made a corner in Oklahoma and they're starting to heat up and Daryl, the markets in cattle and beef are starting to heat up too. I tell you, the last month before the 4th of July, we saw a, a tremendous run up in the markets, not really anticipated. Uh, you know, we, we went into the 4th of July weekend with all markets, uh, feeder cattle, fed cattle, wholesale, retail prices, all at record levels. And, and so this is, you know, it, it's, it's the continuation of a trend that really started about a year ago. You know, the first half of 2013 was a, was a downtrend and the markets really took off just about, uh, you know, the, uh, about a year ago. And, and what we're seeing now is a continuation of that, uh, that long uh, move higher. We're really seeing the impacts of, of tighter supplies in the industry. Okay, it, it, let's, let's talk about the demand on that too. I mean, that, that has to be there also. You know, there's a lot of questions now about uh, how demand will react to this. We're right. obviously pushing prices higher than we've ever seen before. Um, you know, the bottom line is beef demand, both domestically and internationally, has proven to be very robust through this so far. Uh, and I, you know, I think that's a, maybe a surprise to producers. We didn't know how people would react, but the bottom line is beef demand is holding up well. It's allowing these prices to work uh, at some level. Not to say we don't have some stresses on some of the margins as things adjust, but in general, as long as the demand is there, these high prices can work uh, throughout the industry. Okay, with, with, with the high prices so early in the season, are we going into uncharted territory here? We really are, you know, and, and that's a big question, I guess, now is what do we expect the second half of right. this year? And, and uh, you know, I, I think we don't expect to, to see the markets continue trending up like they have. In all honesty, a month ago, we didn't expect to see what happened the last month. So we're not sure what will happen. But more than likely, these markets will level off here. I think we're going to move mostly sideways through the second half of the year. I don't see any real downside pressure in this market. Um, at the same time, I think it's unlikely that we will continue to go up. So I think these markets are going to spend the second half of the year kind of moving sideways, consolidating uh, all of the, uh, the, the, the factors that are at play here at the level we're at. Okay, how, how are corn supplies going to play into this? Well, that's one of the factors we're looking at. We have prospects now for an excellent corn crop. Mm -hmm. That's going to keep feed prices moderate, and that helps certainly at the feedlot sector, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, what they're really struggling the most with right now is the fact that feeder cattle are so expensive, they're going to face higher break-evens as we go forward, uh, even with uh, inexpensive feed. Okay, and, and then on top of that, do you think the, the, the herd will expand to, to uh, help with that? At this point, given the slaughter numbers we're seeing, um, it looks very much like herd expansion is in place. We'll get a mid-year cattle inventory report this year, which will tell us something, although we don't have last year to compare to. But uh, you know, I think it's going to confirm probably that, uh, that we are in the process of a, at least a modest level of expansion so far. Okay, so the, the, the near future, it looks good to be a cattle producer. You know, cow-calf producers are in the driver's seat. This market needs supply, and, and so that's going to be there. Stockers, uh, again, even though the prices are really high for these calves you're buying, the value of gain is pretty good. That works. Feedlots continue to struggle with high break-evens. Packers uh, intermittently have margin issues, but in general, as long as the demand is there, uh, the margins work for both the packer and feedlot levels. Okay, thank you much. Daryl Peel, Livestock Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. In the past on the cow-calf corner, we've talked about the possibility of some of the summer annuals actually uh, accumulating toxic levels of nitrates. That could be a problem for feeding this later in the winter to our cattle. One of the myths about nitrate accumulation in summer annuals is that it's different at different times of the day. One of the things that for years ranchers and, and farmers would do was to cut it late in the day, thinking that the nitrate that accumulated overnight 
would be metabolized, utilized by the plant during the course of sunlight in the day, and therefore later in the day it would be lower. Well, several years ago, some of our county extension educators and, and area livestock agents decided to test that theory. So they went to five different farms in central and western Oklahoma, and they took samples from summer annual crops at 8 a.m., 10 a.m., 12 noon, 2 p.m., 4 p.m., and the last one taken at 6 p.m. to see if there were differences in the nitrate concentration in those plants during the course of a day. And what they found was there was very little difference depending on the time of day that the, the plants were harvested. They did find big differences between farms, indicating again that the variety of the plant may have a, 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 an implication in this business of nitrate accumulation. Certainly, the fertility of the soil and the environmental conditions, all of those things can have a big impact on the nitrate concentration in these plants. But time of day of harvest really didn't. We thought it'd be helpful to you as we talk about these summer annuals this summer so that we can put up the best quality hay that we possibly can. I would suggest that before you cut a hay crop of these summer annuals, visit your county extension office. Have the hay tested so that you know what's in it before it's cut. Once it's cut, that nitrate concentration stays the same. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow-Calf Corner. Now we want to take a look at a few agriculture news apps for your smartphone or tablet that you may find handy. Here's Brian Arnell. One of my largest categories is the agriculture news and weather apps. In this category, I have 20 different applications. This is the one category that I say really fits the user needs, that you can use, choose an app just by the way it looks and by the way you like to utilize it. In these apps, many of them, will give market updates, they'll give current news and weather reports. So in this, I choose an app that has reporting that fits my needs. Many of them are based in the corn states, so they're very corn heavy. I like to choose an app that may have more wheat and other southern ag. The DTN from Progressive Farmer was one of my first apps. I do enjoy this one. It has some nice news and weather, has nice market updates, and it has a very clean and user-friendly layout and design. Another app that I do enjoy uh, for the news and weather comes from Oklahoma's Ron Hayes with Radio Oklahoma Network. Within this, it gives our news and his updates along with the canola reports. For more information on these apps and others, go to my blog. The link is through sunup.okstate.edu. Now to the ever-present battle against invasive plants and the vine that appears to be taking an even stronger hold in Oklahoma. SUNUP's Austin Moore explains. Okay, so what we have here is an, a very old, mature series of, of holly plants. And this, this kudzu is grown just, uh, you know, in amongst it. We found over a 30 or 40 feet area here, we found at least three or four major structures where we have, you know, mature woody stems this big around. And yes, so Payne so County we'll Extension advantage. Educator Keith so Reed is talking about kudzu. The vine that ate the south is now in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Late last summer, a Stillwater resident walked into my office with a, a piece of this and said, do you know what this is? And I, I wasn't quite sure because it looked like enormous poison ivy. And I said, well, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. And he said, well, it's kudzu. And I looked at him kind of quizzically and I said, well, are you sure? We don't have kudzu here. The gentleman was correct. While kudzu is usually thought of as only a problem for the southeastern U.S., in recent years, it has been popping up in Oklahoma. Right now, we're looking at around 40 to 50 locations in Oklahoma that have active, very healthy populations of kudzu. They overwinter and re-sprout back. Karen Hickman is an invasive species specialist at Oklahoma State University. If someone didn't know poison ivy, they might think that it looks like poison ivy just because of the three leaflets. 
but it has a really fuzzy leaf um, texture. So there's a lot of hair on the surface of it um, that really kind of protects it from insect damage. Another characteristic is as you look at its stem, it has a lot of rusty brown spots over the surface of it that are also covered by the hair. Another characteristic that it does that I can show you from this stem is there's three or four um, vines that have wrapped themselves together, mainly trying to get support so they can reach another structure to be able to grab hold of to then cover it as well. While kudzu is listed federally as a noxious weed, it is not labeled as such in Oklahoma. That may contribute to the largest factor in spreading this plant in Oklahoma not being nature, but rather unwitting plant lovers. Typically it's a cutting. It's like a geranium. Uh, they go out, somebody sees a pretty plant, and they come and they plant it on their property. So they might quickly think, oh, this is a beautiful plant, it's going to grow, make me a vine, and they don't realize the future damage and the future labor that, that they're going to have to invest to be able to control it. And that is a daunting task, usually requiring several years of both mechanical and chemical treatment. I hope there's no one watching this that has this problem, but I think, uh, you know, we can't think that way. If it's here, it's somewhere else. Uh, if you do find it, don't, uh, don't panic, don't freak out, but let's be aggressive and, and try to eradicate it. A goal you can certainly receive guidance in from your local county extension office. For SUNUP, I'm Austin Moore. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime online at sunup.okstate.edu. You can also follow us on YouTube and other social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone, and we'll see you next time at SUNUP.